Joe Cusio holds a doctoral degree in educational psychology and assessment from the University of Iowa. He's a professor emeritus of psychology at Marymount California University. He's a 14-time four four recipient of the Faculty Member of the Year Award on his home campus, and that award is student-driven based on effective teaching and academic advising. He's also a recipient of the Outstanding First Year Student Advocate Award from the National Resource Center for the First Year Experience and Students in Transition, and a recipient of the Diamond Honoree Award from the American College Personnel Association, or ACPA, for contributions made to student development and the student affairs profession. Currently, he serves as a workshop facilitator and educational consultant for colleges and universities, including AVID for Higher Education, and that's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote the college access and success of underserved student populations. He's authored numerous books art and articles on student learning, student retention, and faculty development. So we have three different books out front that I just mentioned. Um, the three that we have are Thriving in College and Beyond, and one of those is for four-year schools, the other one is for two years, so that's two of them. And then the third book is Peer-to-Peer -peer Leadership. And as I mentioned, he will be available for signing. So please help me welcome Joe Cusio. for reflection, guys. Yeah. Let's see. Maybe getting a little... I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I don't have ADHD, but I have the HD part. I just can't stand in one place. So, and I'm from New York. No one has ever said I spoke too softly. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, and thanks for coming to the conference. You know, the more I think about retention, it's the ultimate student outcome. It makes all other outcomes possible. There's no student learning, no development if they're not there to learn and develop. Um, it's actually, you could argue that retention is a precondition or prerequisite for all other uh, outcomes. So I appreciate your commitment to the topic. I want to thank the conference organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, I know this is the politically correct or socially sensitive thing to say, but they're we're very um, well organized, um, um, very warm. And since they were housed at the University of Oklahoma, I tried to honor them by wearing crimson and cream. H how do I look? I mean, uh, <laughs> I had a shop for this shirt. You've heard of the expression, some people like to shop till they drop. I drop at the very thought of shopping. So just to be able to get this and to distinguish it from another southern campus, if I went too red, I could be in trouble. So that was a tough, tough decision. Um, one of the requests I had, many of the requests that they were kind enough to respond to, was the roster. And you stole sort of one of my lines was to go through all the, uh, not, not this convergent validity. What a motley, no, let, let me rephrase that. What a uh, diverse array of professionals we have here. Um, and. Uh, uh, Sandra gave you the whole list, but from every sector of education, small liberal arts colleges, community colleges, comprehensive state universities, research intensive, extensive, and hypertensive uh, universities are here. Um, you know, when I first, I'm a faculty member who knew nothing about retention. I was basically voluntold to be on the retention committee and ended up chairing it. But I remember in the late 80s, and you have to bear with me, I'm an old timer. Uh, early 90s, how retention, quote, is everybody's business, and retention requires a total institutional response. Well, I think that's well illustrated by the representation of folks here today. My thesis is there's another, you may have heard this aphorism, it takes the whole college to educate the whole student. Uh, and that's where I'm trying to, uh, that's the intersection I want to get at here, uh, that that when you're talking about retention, you're ultimately talking about education. I can't see it's separated. When you're talking about um, promoting student persistence, you're talking about promoting student learning and development. 
Um, let me see if I got this going here. However you define this wellness wheel or holistic development, are you familiar with Howard Gardner? He would argue that all these are forms of intelligences. And we all know that all of these are involved um, in student retention as well. So my thesis for today, I guess, is that um, student retention and student education are inseparable, inextricable processes, and that if you're in the retention business, you're in the education business. And I need, particularly faculty, need to hear that. Um, you can't separate these. Now, you have an outline in front of you. There was another one of my requests that the, the consortium folks were kind enough to accommodate me. This is something I actually used when I first started teaching at Kirkwood Community College. Is anyone here from Kirkwood Community College? Yes, I thought I saw you on the roster. My first teaching job, great students, but they weren't taking notes. You know, and then when I'd write on the board, I'd lose eye contact with them, and then there would be some conversations. And so I thought maybe if I gave them a little typed out the key concepts and leave spaces, like maybe that they would write in in those areas things to embellish, and it worked. And this was like 1975, and I thought, now I'm going to write this up in the Journal of the Teaching of Psychology. I, I've really come up with something here to enhance the quality of student note-taking. And you know, you do the literature review before they write the article, and the British had this all figured out about 40 years or earlier. They call them skeletal notes or program notes. Anyway, that was the logic uh, behind the handout there. I, I called it uh, retention learning and natural marriage. What I'm after here is killing two birds with one that sounds too aggressive. There is a symbiotic and synergistic relationship between retention and learning, is my argument here. You've heard of these old expressions, successful retention is nothing more than successful education. Retention is a byproduct of effective education. Now, all those are aphorisms. You may be familiar with George Koo, anthropologist by trade, uh, the engineer of the Nessie. Um, he had a, a project called DEEP documenting effective educational practices. And this aphorism that if we focus on learning, retention will follow has been empirically validated by Ku's work, that those institutions who had the greatest impact on student retention focused on student learning. Pragmatically, that makes a difference. And even politically, I think it does too. We've got to get faculty on board. They have to realize that we're in the learning business as much as we are in the enrollment management business. Uh, that's my thesis, I'll, uh, and you're going to get plenty of chance to talk. I apologize in advance to talking at you. If I rehearse this properly, we've got a lot of time for Q&A. And I'm also available, but I don't want to interfere. You've got some great sessions going on right after mine, so I want to give you plenty of time to go to those. I wish I could bi-locate and go to those sessions myself, but I'll be here. Um, you may have heard in, in the learning field the new learning paradigm. We need to move from teaching to learning. We've been focusing historically on what teachers do and covering our material, but we need to focus on what the student is learning and, and the processes of learning. That's what really matters. That's the shift, the new learning paradigm, as they call it in the academic side. Um, I would argue that we need the same paradigm for retention. We need to move from a focus on programming to a focus on persisting. What are the students doing or experiencing as we offer our programs? I, this may seem obvious, but I think it parallels the teaching and learning. Let's forget about the lecture and what he's covering, but what are the, are the students getting it? How are the students learning in the process of delivering the lecture? Similarly, how, what are, what's happening to students as we are delivering our programs? What should be the experiences they're having? Does this quote seem familiar to you? The college is what the student experiences. I think that's what our Sandy spoke about yesterday, and I think this is one of those serendipitous things where I think we're on the same path. I'm arguing um, the program is what the student experiences. That's the base. But my, what is this, convergent validity? Can we give a fancy name for this, or just serendipity? We just happen to hit on, on the same point. Um, now, the seven principles there that you that I have listed are all student-centered. This is what should be happening to students as we deliver our programs or interact with them. It's not about us. The last page I hedged, the very last page of the outline, you'll see some program principles. What would be the ideal features of an effective program? I just thought you might like to have that 
And you can access this electronically as well. So if you want to borrow any of this stuff, use it. Uh, that's focusing on programs. The meat of our time together is focusing on the students. What should they be experiencing uh, as we deliver our program? As you can see from the outline, all of those are research-based. Uh, you may recognize many of the references. I don't have all the references in the back. But I'm go I talked with Sandra. There's a narrative version of what I'm presenting to you today with the references, if this might help you if you're working on a dissertation or a white paper. Uh, I gave this talk similar in, uh, was the start of the industrial, when did, it? Lowell, Massachusetts. And uh, a faculty member came up, you know, how fact, hi, Tammy, good to see you, um, came up and said, Joe, some of those references, and he meant, he, he was nice. He said, Joe, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. But some of those references are pretty dated. And I, I got them. Um, and no, it's not a competitive thing. Get me, don't get me wrong. I just said, you know, Bill, Bill, that was by design. I wanted to show the range of time that we keep recycling these same principles. It, it, sh it shows their timelessness. I think these principles have withstood the test of time. I'm not saying I got it all figured out, but they're holding up pretty well. It's to the point now, if I'm talking to advisors, I'm talking about the seven principles. If I'm talking to faculty about learning, I'm talking about the seven principles. It, they seem to be applicable cross-contextually. And I think they apply very well to student retention as well. They are timeless. So please don't look at those as dated. I was trying to show how these principles have withstood the test of time. Um, I think they're universal. Uh, they apply to all student populations. Now, they may be particularly effective for students who are at risk. But what's that expression? A rising tide lifts. Well, you have to help me with Proverbs. I lost oxygen during. It's not my fault. It's my mother's fault. A rising tide lifts all boats, right? So I think the principles apply to all students. Uh, they may have a differential, particularly powerful impact on at-risk students, because they may have a need to rise the highest to the surface. But I don't think it's robbing from Peter to give to Paul. I think this works for all students, particularly those students who may be at risk. I think it applies to all programs. Um, let me see here. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, no, did I lose? No, this is going to be, no, no. This is all being recorded. I wonder what happened. Okay, now I'll have to go to page up. Oh, I've lost all, oh, the shucks. I'm sorry, guys. Another pause for reflection. Well, Blake helps me. Maybe I'll go on without the visuals. We'll get it rectified, I'm sure. What I was going to show you is I, I see these principles cutting across whatever program that you're operating, how we might be able to infuse them into those programs. See now. Thank you very much. Blake is a graduate of the Oklahoma, uh, University of Oklahoma, by the way. Oklahoma is going to get a lot of attention this morning, and they deserve it. Um, I'm seeing this whatever, I'm looking at this as something that would pervade any program. In other words, how is personal validation built into orientation or first year experience or general ed or advising? I would argue too, they would apply to all positions. So I could take that horizontal access, access, horizontal access on top and substitute academic advisors, FYE professionals, faculty, uh, student retention specialist, or whatever your position is. I think what we're talking about this morning is not just programs, it's a way of interacting with students. We can pr promote personal validation and self-awareness and social integration either through programs or through the way we interact with students on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think these are actions. You know, um, anyone, any place, any time could implement this. Faculty, staff, peer mentors. And let me say this about administrative assistants and staff. I know we have the customer service approach there for retention. It's been my experience that staff can do all of these things. They're more than just customer service agents. I find them to be powerful mentors, uh, educators. Uh, I, I think they could be equipped with this language as well. And I think they do it intuitively already. 
The other thing about these is that these are scalable. You know, you hear this notion, we don't have the resources to add more programs. What could we do to in infuse into our existing programs to increase their potency and impact? There's a concern about adding programs. I know there are a lot of high impact practices and they're gonna go up, and not to denigrate the importance of high impact practices. But at places I go, they talk, I hear this term initiative fatigue. Have you heard that? Not yet another thing we're gonna add on and add on. And we can keep going with that approach, but that's the danger of it. It costs more resources, and it also adds to initiative fatigue. I, you know, whoop, I got ahead of myself there. Um, I was, when I was preparing this, I came across a couple of documents, a couple of articles. You know, you think, am I off base here? I think these next two quotes uh, support the thesis that I'm trying to convey to you today. Number one was from the AA. SCU, uh, and you see the reference on the bottom. Adopting an action strategy based on programs can send an unintended message that only those directly involved in them are responsible for student success. Ironically and unintentionally, this perspective may actually discourage widespread internalization of this responsibility in the form of a student-centered culture. In other words, programs are responsibilities of certain people. Uh, if we talk about processes or principles, that can be applied by anybody. It's not owned. There's not that territoriality. That's a four-year perspective. From the two-year perspective, the two-year folks are, are represented here. I'm happy to see them. Um, Jennifer Karp, this, she's at a senior research associate at uh, the Community College Research Center in Columbia. I think she's saying what I'm trying to say, or I'm trying to say what she's saying. A shift is needed. Efforts to improve persistence should focus on processes, not programs. Shifting our lens to look at mechanisms rather than programs, we can see how reforms might result merely in tinkering around the edges rather than the establishment of environments that truly help students create relationships or gain essential information. So we're looking for something that's more systemic, pervasive, that not would, would not be bounded within a particular program. That's my hope. Um, my all, we talk, I, the, everywhere I go, it's, we want to create a student-centered culture or a culture of student success, you've heard that expression. Well, then that begs the question, what defines a culture? And to me, one of the core characteristics of a culture is a common language. I'm hoping, now remember I grew up in the 60s, so I may be a little idealistic, or maybe I'm Mary Poppins reincarnated, I don't know. But I would love to see a common language that we could all share, a universal language of student persistence and student success across programs, across departments, um, that would unite us in this uh, quest for culture. We have a common cultural goal, students' persistence to graduation, but what about a common language and common customs, common behaviors that we can all implement recursively, right? Repeat them, reinforce them so students experience them over and over again, so it ends up having a cumulative impact on student success. I know that sounds Pollyannish, but that's really what I'm after. I was at a session yesterday um, where the presenter said, we need to feed the faculty the lines they need to use, because we're not. I mean, I'm a typical PhD graduate, no training and retention advising, all the things I was expected to do. I have never got any experience in graduate school. But the, thesis, the proposal there, we need to feed faculty the lines, how to converse with students about an early alert, about promoting their success. We need that common language, uh, I would argue, uh, across campus. Uh, to create that culture? What could unite us? As we go through this, in terms of applying it, I would say think about how these principles, now I'll flesh them out, might be infused into your existing programs. How could we build self-awareness into our orientation program? More social integration into whatever program you're developing. That's one way to look at it. The other way, even if you're not responsible for a program, how might we through the right words at the right time with a student individually, interactions with students might we suggest or implement these principles. So I'm looking at it both programmatically, think about it, how you could infuse them into your existing programs, or might just exhibit them in your day-to-day -day actions and behaviors, if that makes any sense. I promise I'm gonna give you a chance to talk sooner or later, hopefully sooner. Let's start looking at these principles. That's the introduction. Um, personal validation. You see it on the outline. I don't want to read it to you. 
Uh, but it's basically the idea that when we make students feel recognized as individuals, that they matter to the college, you might be familiar with Schlossberg and Chickering. Those guys developed that. Um, and the college cares about their success. You may be familiar with a gentleman by the name of Vince Tinto. Grew up in my same neighborhood, New York. We have a lot in common. Same ethnic background. Same height. I have a brother named Vince Vinny. That's my brother Vinny, not my cousin Vinny. I have a brother <laughs> named Vince, so we have a lot in common. Anyway, so I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, New Yorkers are very ethnically conscious. I grew up in a German-Irish neighborhood. Where they gave me such a hard time. Can I share one thing? I, I can't get it out of my head. Who's the old, you know why you don't have freckles? Well, my first response is, why would I want them in the first place? But anyway, because they'd slide right off your greasy Italian face. So I'm a little ethnically conscious, so bear with me. It's, uh... But here's Vince Tinto. Um, students are more likely to become committed to the institution and therefore stay when they come to understand that the institution is committed to them. There is no ready programmatic substitute for this sort of commitment. Pro programs cannot replace the absence of high quality, caring, and concerned faculty and staff. Now, that's a, a number crunching sociologist with a master's degree in physics. I mean, he, he uses the caring word. Um, and I'm, that's, what I'm, that's what validation is about here. Now, bringing it down to an empirical level more recently, for the community college folks out there, it was a study done at 900 students, 13 community colleges in California on the left coast, the land of fruits and nuts where I'm living now. Um, and they asked them what, what they think supports their, these were first generation students, often low income and often from underrepresented. And unfortunately, those three tend to go together, as you know. What they think supported their success. What I like about this is they asked the students. Remember Sandy said, yes, I'm tired of those four surveys. Let's hear the students' voices. That's what I liked about this um, study. And it's referenced in that uh, narrative you can get uh, later. Uh, and they said, feeling that their success mattered to others. That was one of the top ranking reasons they gave to answer to the question, what they think supports their success. Quote, feeling their success mattered to others. And that uh, was from a study called Student Success Redefined, uh, the largest community college study on, on the left coast that we did. Now, you know, I think intuitively we all knew this. Don't, don't you know, professionals working in the field, we figure out what matters, and then three years later we find that there's a theory of support, what we figured out on our own anyway. Well, now there is a theory for this kind of notion of caring. And it's, you may be familiar with Laura Rendon. Uh, she, uh, it, her theory is personal validation theory. Laura Rendon is at UT San Antonio, and he's probably the leading researcher on first generation students, underrepresented students, uh, and she's cited in, in, in the narrative as well. She calls this, I think she got married, I'm sorry, Rendon Linares, her name is now. Um, and she talks about personal validation. Now, we're going to talk about how to implement in a second. It's true for all students, but particularly for first generation students. You've heard of the imposter syndrome where I don't really belong here. None of my family or friends have been here. How do I feel like I belong here? And I know we've got belonging this theory and social integration later. But uh, uh, Randone's point is, is validation. The sense that you care about their being there and being successful is particularly important for first generation students who may have doubts whether they even belong in college in the first place. Um, Noah Levitz, which is now Ruffalo Noah Levitz. I, I'm assuming Ruffalo is of Italian descent, but that's irrelevant. Um, Noah Levitz, before Ruffalo joined Noah Levitz, 1989, you may be, this is, again, bear with me. These are classics. They found um, sophomore return rates were twice as high for students. They, they did an end of first year survey. Those who came back the second year, if they could mention some, that there was somebody they knew on campus who they could turn to for personal help or assistance with a problem, if they answered yes to that question, they were twice as likely to return the sophomore year. So I'm hearing, seeing Tinto, I'm hearing, hearing Rendon, I'm getting flashbacks to Noah Levitt's 1989, same idea. We're in the relationship building business, I'm sorry. Um, relationships are the cornerstone for retention, and now we have a theory to support it. How do we do this? And I would love to engage you in a discussion later about this. 
These are just my top tips. Can we learn students' name? Can we be intentional about this? I've had so many people, well, I'm not good at names and I'm good with faces. Well, welcome to the human species. We're all better with faces visually and just recognize. But I really believe that we can be more intentional. I'm much better at names now than I was 20 years ago. And I didn't come up with some kind of genetic transplant in that 20 year period. I've just gotten more conscious of it. I know it matters to students, and now I do this for a living. Uh, it matters to faculty and staff, too. It matters to everyone. Dale Carnegie had it right in 1936. What would he say? The sweetest sound? Thank you. I'll need help from the audience periodically, so let's do it. Um, the sweetest sound, sound of your name, okay? And it, 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 it's more than just knowing a person's name. It, it makes the student feel that they're not a number on an Excel spreadsheet. They're not student number 07042. 3062, which happens to be my social security number. Okay. Jerry, don't write it down. You're on the board. You have to be ethical. He's writing down my social security number. Now, seriously, you've heard of the first year experience movement started in South Carolina in the late 60s. I, uh, a Canadian did a dissertation on the origin of the first year experience movement. I wrote to John Gardner, and he shipped me the dissertation, and, and I read it. Anything not to clean out the garage. I, I, I read the thing, and then uh, one interesting event that sparked the president of the University of South Carolina, who recruited John Gardner to advance, Tom Jones, his name, not, not that Welsh singer who always had that, you know, that Tom Jones, he was an engineer, actually, by trade. Um, he got a Christmas card from a student, and the student did not sign his or her name, put the, his or her student number. It really was a, a critical incident for the president. It was the message that you, you treat us at, in a dehumanizing way. Again, USC, a flagship research, not the Trojans, we're now we're talking about the Gamecocks. Large first year classes, no one knows the name. That started the first year experience. We need to create a small first year seminar so these students are not dehumanized. Uh, let's get to know their names. And, and that was a big event to the president's credit. I like the way Laura Rendon puts this idea of learning who our students are, and I would argue in just a bit, learning something about them under the rubric of validation. She puts it this way. It's more than just being nice. It's a form of basic validation. It says, I recognize you as a person with an identity, a character, and needs. You're not just a number, sorry, not my New York thing, a number, a raw material called student to me. Um, that's I, I, my, one of my favorite quotes with the idea of knowing who students are. If we can be intentional, and can we use technology to help us here? I like the idea of technology, it's high tech, high touch. Can we get photos? Uh, I remember yesterday, is this a FERPA issue? I know some campuses, as soon as they say that, no, we can't do that, dude, that's a violation of FERPA. But I was at the University of Mississippi, they have photos uh, for their first year seminar, their students right on the roster, St. Cloud Community College in Kansas. Uh, all their advisors have their, um, advisees' photos loaded onto their um, uh, software. Um, someone comes into your office and you could say, hi, Charles. I can't tell, it's just, hi, Charles. There really is a Charles out there. And unlike uh, Jerry, he's not, he didn't write down my social security number when I, okay. Uh, I met them last night, so I'm really being socially sensitive. I wouldn't do that for someone I didn't know. Uh, especially in your large campuses, can we make your large campus seem small? And I think one way to do that is learning names. I have a little, actually, a handout on that if you want it, but I think technology can help. Students are always doing selfies anyway. Uh, let's, let's use that and get to know them as individuals. And then I would argue, let's get to know about them. It's one thing to know who a student is, but can we know about their dreams, their goals, their backgrounds, their values, their passions, their talents? Uh, I'm very big on intake, that first impression, whether it's the first advisor meeting, the first meeting of class, or you meet it, can we get some information in orientation um, about who our students are? I did devise a student information sheet. I'm mentioning these things I'd be happy to share with you. My wife wants me to reorganize the garage, so if you keep me busy with, I'm a reliable email correspondent, and this will all give me the excuse I need not to reorganize. I could tell Mary, no, I've got my consortium friends I have to deal with. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I'm trying. It's, uh, Again, not forced choice, open-ended questions. When, when students, another person comes to you for help, what is it for? They come to you for advice. What is it for? I'm trying to get at their talents. Uh, 
When time flies by, what are you doing? What could you do when you're dead tired? Just questions that might get at their passions, that, that their values, their, their talents in an open-ended way. Um, my dream would be to use technology what, like Amazon does to me, and I fall for it every time. Dear Joe, new buddy guy CD just out this week, and other blue CDs you may be interested in. <laughs> really? Just for me? And just in time? You know, wouldn't it be great if we had an intake form where we got students' ideas of their passions, their goals, their dreams, and then used high tech to do just in time message, internship available, service learning experience on their iPhone? Can we use high tech not only to, high tech, not only to sell products? but to promote success. Uh, I don't have the skills to do that. Whatever the software is, cookies or whatever they use, I, I'd love to see our high tech be used to truly, if we want to use the business term customize, I would prefer the more humanistic term, personalize the educational experience. Um, and I guess I'm saying, in addition to early alert, where we alert them for things that they're not doing, can we alert them for things that they could do that would align with their passions and goals. Can we use the same technology uh, in a way to promote personal validation? I'm sorry, guys. I think it's baseball. I always, you know, I used to pitch and have to watch the guy on first, so I'll try to get more to the right here. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention. Well, I mentioned this to faculty, of which I am one. And sometimes I, I go to campuses, not necessarily with, Joe, could you talk to the faculty and get them? And you have a terminal degree and you're still alive to talk about it. Can you tell them, uh, get them to see what, uh, be more student-centered? And this is the hardest one. I'll get, well, we've got to keep a professional distance. We can't get too close to students. They'll take advantage of us. That's not been my experience. My experience is that when you build relationship, you can be more rigorous. Then when you have to be tough with them, they know you're on their side. I would argue that rigor is built on relationships. If we don't build a relationship, they're not going to respond. Uh, when I've gotten in the habit of learning students' names, you, know, you got the 14 time fact of the year thing, you have to build up a speaker. That's why Sandra read all that. What's, what was one of the big keys to my success? Just getting to know my students, taking the time to know them and who they were. That made such a big difference. I didn't learn that in graduate school, and I was able to be more rigorous. I could say, uh, Blake, I don't think you gave me 100% on that paper. I'm sorry. And now, Blake knows that I know him. I know his interests. He knows that I have his back. I can get away with a lot of stuff that I wouldn't be able to get away with um, if I didn't have that relationship to start with. So if you get pushback from faculty, I don't see relationship building and rigor as being an inverse relationship. I see them as, as intertwined. Um, this reminds me of something uh, as we go through here. Rendon research, first generation students. The big word is engagement, right? We want students to engage. That's so important for learning and retention. Her research shows first generation students will not become engaged unless they're first personally validated. Validation is almost a prerequisite for engagement. Sort of an empirical support for what I was trying to share with you anecdotally. When students sense that they're valued and that they care and they're welcomed, then they're more likely to become engaged. She has some hard empirical data in the narrative. Uh, this underscores a point. When I do these seven, conceptually they're distinctive, and I think you can operationally define them distinctively. In the real world, they intersect, right? So when you validation can promote engagement. Self-awareness can promote self-efficacy. So they interchange. We can get big bang for the buck here. OK. Point number two, which should be self-efficacy, growth mindset, and grit. You probably have heard these. And I want to add one more to the list. Um, these are what are called non-cognitive variables. I don't want to split hairs, but I like the way Sandy split hairs the other day, so I'm going to split one semantic. Cognitive means a, a thought or belief. In some ways, these are cognitive in that sense. They're non-academic, maybe, variables. Um, you may have heard of them. Let me briefly go through them. Uh, Self-efficacy goes back to Albert Bandura, if you remember him at Stanford. And it's basically, uh, and there was, I think, a session on locus of control here. An internal locus of control is involved. For self. Students or individuals have to feel they can affect the outcomes of their life, as opposed to being 
controlled by outside. You've heard of the idea of learned helplessness. Uh, that's an external locus of the teacher doesn't like me. There are factors beyond my control. I, I can't, uh, no matter how hard I try, it's not going to make a difference. That's an external locus of control. Um, Self-efficacy involves an internal locus of control. I can do it, and then it's variable. The harder I work, the more likely I can do it, the more effort. It's like, the, remember the little engine that could, that your mom used to read or used to read to your kids, and the gradient would, I think I can, I think I can, and then when the gradient, am I getting this right? And then he would think harder and push harder. That's basically self-efficacy, the idea that you can control the outcome and that you can ratchet it up, uh, that effort can increase the likelihood that outcomes will be achieved. I want to give Bandura credit because he's kind of slipped away on this. I think he started all this and God, I think it was the early 80s was the first study I read about him. Uh, growth mindset may be more familiar to you. She's Carol Dweck, also at Stanford. A similar idea, but applying it more to talent and intelligence. Um, in her own words, growth mindset is based on the belief that your basic qualities are things you can cultivate through your efforts. Although people may differ in their initial talents and aptitudes, everyone can change and grow through application and experience. In other words, intelligence is something you don't have. It's, it's what you get. You know what I mean? Remember the, uh, the sitcom Get Smart? That's what growth mind. You get smart. You, not, you aren't, aren't smart. You get smart. Um, I planted some people to, to do courtesy laughs in case none of my jokes work. So if you hear them, they, I, I did try to load the dice there. Um, I think it's an important uh, distinction to make. Uh, we are very IQ conscious, SAT conscious. You hear terms like we want to get the most talented students or the most able students. Now, watch our language in America. We're very, very talent ability focused compared to other countries, particularly Eastern Asian countries. I have to share an anecdote. This would be classic Carol Dweck if she were with me at this Starbucks around the corner from my house in, in Southern California. Um, there was a, a tutor working with two high school kids. They uh, appeared to be of Hispanic background. They all were, the tutor as well. And this one boy was not doing his homework. He wasn't, no, I can't do it, I can't do it. No, you can do it, try it. And he eventually did it. When he finished, the tutor said, see how smart you are? Carol Dweck, if she were there and would make an appearance, that, that's the worst thing you can say. No, what we should, the feedback should have been, see when you worked hard at it and you persisted, you finished. And what strategies did you use to do it? Those are malleable. You, can, you can't change smartness. Her response, how smart you are. I hear parents do this a lot, too. You can't replicate smartness, but you can replicate effort and strategy. And Dweck would say, well, what about if the student fails next time? And you keep telling them how smart, and when they fail, what does that mean? They conclude they're not smart, which is not the message you want to send. A focus on effort and strategy as opposed to talent. And the United States, you know, we're very big on gifted and talented, best and brightest. Um, we need to balance that, according to Dweck, with more of a growth mindset strategy. And you've heard of grit. These all kind of, uh, this could be an example of triangulation, I guess, if we want to impress the assessment people. We got Bandura with self-efficacy. That's one part of the triangle. Then you got, uh, who did I just do? Growth mindset. And now here's Angela Duckworth former school teacher turned psychologist, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, grit is perseverance and passion for long-term goals, working strenuously toward challenges, maintaining effort and interest over years despite failure, adversity, and plateaus in progress. Whereas disappointment or boredom signals to others that it's time to change trajectory and cut losses, the gritty individual stays the course. The difference here, they're all related I think this one has to do more with persistence over time. And I love to use the word persistence. I know we can't change retention now. I'm not saying we rename the consortium. But you know, as I never got retention. My wife's an elementary school teacher. When she retains a student, that isn't good. <laughs> you know. no, no, seriously, and as, as a faculty member trying to convince other retention, and you know, it has such a, let, it's almost constipatory, right? Let's retain them like we're retaining water. We need a diuretic or something. Uh, I don't mean to be silly. Uh, you don't have to give me courtesy laughs. I was teasing before. 
But persistence has, doesn't have the input, carries this connotation. You've got to hang in there. And it, I think it's more uh, palatable to faculty because it implies it's a two-way street. That we, you can do so much, but ultimately the student has a role in the persistence process. Furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, I look at retention as an outcome just as important. It's the retention paradox. You've heard of that. That it's both a prerequisite and an outcome uh, of learning. Learning retention is a byproduct of learning, but if they're not retained, they're not even there to learn anyway. That's the, the retention paradox. Um, but if we want to go to outcome language, retention is not a student outcome. Institutions retain, right? Students persist. Now, I don't know if you can, language I'm finding matters a lot, particularly when you're trying to persuade skeptics and those who try to get on board. I like persistence because it picks up this notion of grit that Angela Duckworth is, is getting a lot of attention for. Um, and grit, basically, if you break it down, I just finished reading her book. I'm a slow reader, and I finally got through it and, and took my notes. There are two parts to it. There's tenacity, sticking with it over time. And then there's resilience. When you encounter an obstacle, you bounce back, right? These are the comeback kids who, when they encounter a setback, they bounce back and turn it into a comeback, so to speak. Um, those are the, her messages. Uh, the word productive struggle, have you heard of that phrase? That struggled, this is a key point. American students compared to, or they compared them to East Asian students. When they struggle on a problem, can't get it, they kind of are more likely to give up, thinking I'm not smart. In the East Asian tradition, talent follows effort. Famous Chinese expression, the harder you fall, the higher you bounce. It's that Confucian principle. Uh, compared to East Asian students, struggle is part of the process. It's a part, part of the process of getting smart, is you struggle. She's finding that American students, when they can't get it right away, struggle is an indication of lack of smartness or aptitude rather than, this is just part of the process of getting it. Uh, something I, you know, I'd want to talk to you more about later if you have time. Um, Duckworth, oh, I, I wanted to say, one, well, I still, I gotta set this up. There's a new one. My wife and I are involved in this uh, organization for abused children. A couple of weeks ago, there was a speaker there talking about this hope scale at the University of Oklahoma Tulsa campus. And I thought, gee, I'm going to, this event, let me check this out. So this, I didn't put it in there. I couldn't find as much data to support it as a principle, but something that we might want to look into. This is, I believe, at the University of Oklahoma Tulsa campus. There's a Hope Research Center. Hope is a belief that the future will be better and you have the power to make it so. Hope is based on three main ideas, desirable goals, pathways to goal attainment, and here's the one that ties in with uh, grit and self-advocacy, agency willpower to pursue these pathways. So now you've got a fourth factor we might want to look at. I, I tried to find, there's a guy named Charles Snyder, positive psychology movement, and he had an article in 1995 that students who were higher in hope at entry freshman year were more likely to persist to junior year. Something to think about if you're doing a dissertation, you want to add a fourth factor to this growth mindset, grit, and self-efficacy. I just didn't have enough data to really say it's, it's support as a principle. But I wanted to give more uh, attention to University of Oklahoma because they're get you know I just thought it would be a nice thing to do and also tried to get the color of their oh, never mind um, and seriously and then there's a session here uh, talking about work ethic a work ethic scale I think the gentleman it might be at University of South Carolina I see a lot of what would we call this again convergence validity that this is a, a hot principle now the idea of effort persistence resilience tenacity uh, bouncing back from comebacks a big one, and I think it has major implications for our work in the field of student persistence or retention. Some quick ideas from me, but I'm hoping we'll have time to talk more. How do we develop grits? It seems like it's something you got or not. You're a gritty person, like it's a trait. Can we manipulate grit? Can we make students grittier, more resilient? Quick thoughts on this. I don't claim to be an expert uh, on it. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, oh, no, not again. Is it something I'm doing? That's OK. I'll keep going. And uh, I think the video will show how, how resilient we are and we deal with all this stuff. Oh, we, what happened? Oh, OK. OK. Um, 
this is from Duckworth's book. I really like this. I think when I mentioned that learning and retention are related, I think one of the key reasons why is that motivation undergirds both. Students will not learn unless they're motivated. Students will not persist unless they're motivated. She had a section on why reasons why people quit in general, not necessarily students, but I think they're a, applicable to our students as well. This isn't important to me. I'm going to touch upon that later, meaning and relevance. I think it's number three on the list. The effort isn't worth it, like a cost-benefit ratio. Yeah, now can we sell college better? Can we adjust the cost-benefit ratio? That's coming later. On board, we'll talk about engagement and motivating teaching and program delivery strategies. But the one that we're talking about now, I can't do this, so I might as well give up. Those she found in her research nationally are factors that impede motivation. So it's not just a matter of making the material exciting. There are a lot of other factors that we have to uh, consider when promoting students' ability to hang in there and complete whatever they're starting, including their college degree. Um, oh, dar darn it. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not pointing it properly. Oh, okay, so my battery died out. Well, I just tested the batteries before I came. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll just have to be more, less mobile. Uh, that might throw my game off, but I have no game to begin with, so we'll not worry about that. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, this idea of balancing challenge and support, uh, how do you promote, uh, again, um, a growth mindset when there's moderate challenge? Uh, students are more likely, they don't want to be bored to death. That's not going to promote effort. It, they don't want something that's over their head. All this developmental education now, though, all this placement testing and acceleration, you've heard, uh, faculty get nervous about that word acceleration, like it's going to be social promotion. We're going to push them through. I always thought the developmental education uh, acceleration model might have been just as well articulated as, a, as an optimization model. We're trying to get students at that sweet spot in their developmental courses where they're not retaking stuff that just a little rehearsal they could have gotten out of high school, but they haven't done math since junior year. Just get that sweet spot, whether it's a module, it doesn't have to necessarily be a whole course. You hit that area where they just need to stretch. That not only would it accelerates, but I would say it's optimization as much as accelerates. It's hitting that moderate challenge, maybe another way to sell develop, accelerated developmental education to the skeptics. We're not trying to socially promote them or ramrod them through and satisfy the politicians who want them in and out in, in three years. We're trying to promote moderate challenge to hit that challenge support sweet spot. Um, I also think, Blake, I'm going to go with the other one. Um, yes, my apologies for the dead batteries. Um, higher education, you know, it's a, not a baby step. Um, the, uh, all the all your people involved in the first year experience movement, um, it's really, I argue, as a way to kind of hit that optimal challenge. First generation students, even if they're academically prepared for college, if their ACT scores are good, their placement, still have a higher risk for attrition. Even when you control for that. There are other factors, as you know, that contribute to that to bridge this gap between where they are and where they come. You've heard of the idea of scaffolding. Now, we're not lowering the bar, right? We're just building the scaffold to bar. Some students can high jump it. Others need a pole vault. Well, I don't know where I'm going with this. No, some need a pole vault and some need a ladder. Um, the, the, but the bar stays the same. So I would argue first year experience movement, supplemental instruction are, are all examples of scaffolding, keeping the bar high, um, not reducing standards or watering down standards but trying to get at this moderate stretch. Um, it's a big difference between high school and higher ed. John Gardner had a comment one. All of what we do is developmental. How can you, that's part of the process of adjusting to college. How can you do college until you get to college? Uh, there has to be some kind of optimal uh, uh, support there. Um, so I would argue this moderate novelty, um, first year experience idea, Bridging that gap. I mean, can I make a plea? It doesn't really fit the point. Can we make it really a first year experience, not a first term experience? I mean, we front load to death, and yet we lose so many students between the end of the spring semester and the start of the fall semester. 
Can we scaffold toward the end of the first year and build a bridge? Can we re-recruit the first year class? Just that mindset. If we have ambassadors to get students to come to our campus, my son was one of those, can we have them uh, do the same and bring them back the second year? Um, we did a ceremony, a first year experience, end of the year ceremony at the end of the first year, just to try to get them excited and prepared for the second. Can we do something, if not a course, something at the end of the first year to make it a bona fide first year experience and first term, or rather than a first term experience, and bridge that gap, not only from high school to higher ed, but from first to second year. Just, just a quick thought off tack. The other thing, resources. You're familiar with this. We want students to succeed. We know that there's a gap here, but they're not utilizing the resources that we provide. And those students who need them the most are the ones who are least likely to use them. You know that. Um, there's a resource utilization gap. And the argument here, I, I would argue this is true for Anybody on, I've seen staff do this well. The art and science of referring students to a resource, referring to a person, uh, documenting the quality of help that that person could be, walking that student over. There. I've seen staff do that better than faculty in some cases. The art and science of referral. Can we share those strategies? I have a little handout on that. Remember, I told you about not cleaning out the garage. So if you want that, let me know. The other thing is, should we make resources less optional and more inescapable, right? The old retention language was intrusive. Uh, our English faculty hated that. We had to drop it. We had to go with assertive outreach because they thought intrusive was too invasive. I don't know. Um, but if students, if we leave it optional and the least motivated students are the ones who opt out, we're in trouble. Um, so the idea of making the optional inescapable I was at Ferris State University once, and um, I remember meeting a lady there who started structured learning assistance, where in SI, it's optional whether they go to those SI sessions, right? She had an, a, a plan. I think she actually, they had test scores, their performance early in the course, like an early alert. If they were not, they were on, on a path that they weren't going to succeed, to stay enrolled in the course, they were required to take those supplemental sessions. That was more of a, how would you say, an intrusive or inescapable support. It wasn't optional. It was uh, required. So and again, if you look at the students we serve, first generation students, we love them, but they're not assertive. They don't take advantage of resources unless we aggressively bring it to them. And males, you know, all males are at risk, not only males of color. Women are killing us in graduation rates despite having, in some cases, lower standardized test scores coming in. There are multiple theories that Sandy talked about the brain, like we may be neuro neurologically challenged. We're a little slower to uh, develop. Uh, I have some brain pictures for you later, not to compete with Sandy, but to reinforce what he was saying. The other thing, and um, you may have seen this, males are less likely to use resources. They're less likely. I, when I go to campus and I talk to the peer leaders, I know there are 60% women in college on average now 40% males, is that roughly the national average? When I speak to the peer leaders, the peer mentors, it's like 90% females. It's way off. And it reminds me of my dad. I love my father. But he would never stop for directions when we were lost on family vacation. I still remember that one. In, we were in Maine somewhere. You know, in New York, is once we get out of the metropolitan area, we're in trouble. And he would not stop for directions. No. It was his... Machismo. I don't know if that's part of the male problem. Uh, we have to destigmatize it. That's the other advantage, I think, of making support in course integrated. Like you have a first year experience course, it's part of the course to interview with a club or organization. Or to, it's not an obvious, just part of the routine. I think that destigmatizes it for males. Oh, OK. Because if it's optional and it's something that's seen as extra, they're afraid they're going to be perceived as being lame in some way. Uh, I'm, I'm just hypothesizing here. I'm not sure. I think um, the intrusive introduction of support services would help first-generation students who just lack the assertiveness and the college knowledge or the social, you have social and cultural capital. We provide that, but they don't have at home. We provide that social and cultural capital that they don't have at home. And I guess with them, we need to be very assertive in terms of our outreach because they are less likely to capitalize or 
take advantage of as, college, as students from a college-going tradition. And then I would argue peers are huge with this uh, self-efficacy thing. Bandura's original work in self-efficacy was with children who had phobias. And one of his biggest findings is that if Joe had hydrophobia, fear of water, and, um, and, and, and I would see Glenn swimming gleefully and always smiling like he does naturally anyway, and I, may, maybe I can do it. And that one of the best ways to treat phobias was to watch someone behaving self-efficaciously in the fearful situation would get the child more likely to uh, engage with the phobia and overcome the phobia. So his idea of the idea of modeling, having all of those of you working with peer mentors and peer tutors, peer coaches, uh, very powerful. And if you remember Vygotsky's work of near peers, zones of proximal development, if the peer is just, this Bandura found this, a 12-year-old would respond better to another 12-year-old or 13-year-old than he would to a 20-year-old. The closer in age, the more identification between the observer and the model, the greater the degree of self-efficacy. So our use of peers, and I would argue, let's not reserve it for juniors and seniors. If you've got sophomores who've just been there, done that in the freshman year with the proper selection and training, they can be optimal peer leaders. Even our alums, I go to camps, they're always bragging about their successful alums who become an anchor on TV or something who are now 60 years old or 40 years old. I like young adult mentors. Students that are currently in college can see they're not very much different than me. Um, our, our intentional use of peers, uh, close in age, might be a way to build self-efficacy. Show them self-efficacious peers. And I would argue, show them not just the honor students, the best and the brightest, but the grittiest and most resilient. I would love to see probationary students be mentored by students who bounce back from probation, those who struggled. We know that from substance abuse. Who makes the best substance abuse counselors? Those who've been there, done that. And I would argue, let's look for those comeback kids and utilize them as mentors for students struggling to come back. Um, San Francisco State, you may have heard of, has a video that they show of students who struggled in their first year. That's their intervention. It's found to have some impact on incoming students. They see that college may involve some certain struggles. They see students who they can identify who've overcome those struggles, and they're reporting um, some positive impact on, on, on student success. Uh, and I would argue, lastly, can we share our own struggles? I mean, do you find that students think we were academic nerds since we were embryos in our mother's womb, that we had it all figured out the whole time? Why can't we share our struggles? Statistics was a disaster. I used to call it sadistics. I hated it so much. <laughs> and um, what did I want? How many here in this room are first generation college graduates? Can't we celebrate that? Why is this a risk factor only? Can we put on our doors first generation students? I mean, I was a first generation student and I, I, I did make mistakes. I was going to be a dentist way off. I could have used more support. I had no clue. But I had so, my parents and my family were so proud of me, I, I just, I, I was buoyed by that. Let's celebrate being first generation. There's so many of your hands went up. Uh, you are potential models. And when you share with students, you model for them the authenticity you want back. You share with students about things that you've struggled with, then they're more likely to come to you when they're struggling. Uh, and, and you can refer to them the support that they need. How am I on my time? I gotta be careful here. Um, I'll accelerate, I promise. Uh, you know, I rehearse these things and then I get up here and I get emotional and I get off track. I told my wife I'm going to stick to the script and I think I deviated five times already. Um, number three is finding meaning and purpose. Um, these last few I'll accelerate so we have more time to talk. Um, I like the way um, Nash and Murray put it. Too often in the academy we insist that our students pursue and achieve a whole host of academic purposes without first helping them to formulate systems of meaning to inform these purposes. Their point is, we're very big. I expect you to do this. College is going to be different. This is what you have to do, what you have to do. They're saying, why? We have to accompany the why with the what. Why are we asking him to do this? Uh, do I have someone else? I like Worgen, putting students first. Effective colleges are not just fostering engagement as if Simply being engaged is something, anything, or enough. 
They are helping students engage with their vocation, their calling, something to be engaged about. I, I know this is patently obvious, but sometimes we slip on that. Um, the reason behind why we're asking him to do this, the why, and it is, can we have a little inspiration accompanying the information and preceding the information? I guess the argument is here. We're big on information and expectations, but why? Um, mo ACT survey. Again, I'm an old timer, but I, um, this was in the 90s, I think, or early 2000s. National survey, why students leave. They asked retention folks all over the country you may be familiar with. Number one, student motivation, ahead of academic preparedness and study skills. When motivation is huge, and this is one element of they don't see the purpose of this. You know the expression, it's academic? Doesn't academic have a negative connotation? What if I said to you, it's all academic? It doesn't sound like it matters. Um, the idea, they give the reason or the rationale behind our programs, our processes, our expectation. Um, we've got to get at, we've got to overcome this. You know, do you have those students in class who are sitting with their back in there and say, Cusio, what do you got? I remember that, you know. Um, it's, it actually, was, that was a birthday card sent to me by my brother Vinny when I was 40, which was just a few uh, decades ago. Uh, but this apathy, you know, we, we, can we be, get them more excited about the college experience rather than assuming that they know it's good for them uh, is the point I'm trying to make. I, now, faculty will say to me, Joe, you can lead a horse to water. And I, I agree. But can we make the horse thirsty? Can we show the horse a path to the watering hole? Can we show the horse other horses that have walked the path successfully? I mean, it, no, seriously. They tend to think motivation is inside and immount. I think we can manipulate motivation. I really do. Uh, and, and I'd love to talk to you more about it. Um, here are some thoughts about how we might do that. Certainly money matters to our students. And I, I, uh, but this is from College Board. I think they have a site that calls Education Pays. I, um, it's just showing the linear relationship between education and income. This is not even mentioning health benefits and all other things. And you do it across time. I'm rushing through this just to give you sometimes a picture. I used to have these on my door. Adorning your office door is a great way to get students to hang out. You've heard of the value of student faculty and student staff contact outside the classroom. I use my door to major advantage that way. And just uh, let's use our campus ecology to excite students about college. Yes, income matters. And uh, there's a whole host of non-academic factors that um, matter in college. You've heard of Pascarella and Terenzini. They're big books. You need steroids to pick them up, and you still get a double hernia if you pick them up. Um, uh, have really done a great job of documenting all these empirically. Uh, the, the last time they were lead, 2005, then I think there was a more recent one there combined with some. Remember, Tinto, Pascarella, and Terenzini were called the retention mafia at one time. Three Italians were doing it. I tried to join. <laughs> I didn't have the record. I, I didn't have the publication record. The criminal record, well, my Uncle Tony, no, that's another story. I'm sorry, I won't go there. Um, why college? I mean, can we make a case for that, both economically and non-economically? Then I would say, why your college? What's special about your place, really? Um, I think we need to articulate that. Don't you have a lot of students where you're, unless you're really a prestigious place, that they're not your first choice? I'm, I'm not willing, and we would say, well, we lost them, we, they weren't. Well, I'm not willing, maybe it's my competitiveness. No, it may not have been their first choice, but I think we could convince them they made a good choice, that it's good to be here. What makes your school special? Do you ever have students transfer in from your school, from other schools? Talk to them. Sometimes they can articulate what's great about your place that you didn't even thought of. We had some of those transfer ins and said, wait, your place really cares. I never knew we cared that much. Uh, I used to bring into my first year seminar class to try to get my students excited that our admissions people, now they had to be coached, they couldn't bad mouth wherever they came from, Bruins, uh, Bears, whatever they came from, but um, a great way to capture what's special about your place. Because students will leave us because they want to trade up, you've heard of that. Transfer out and trade up. This place is more prestigious. Um, and I, I think we can fight that. And I would argue, uh, in terms of exciting students about your college, 
Let's talk, bring our alums back. Let's stop just going after them for their money. Donation matters, but inspiration matters too. Bring them to class. I've never had an alum that I had a relationship with turn me down unless there was a scheduled conflict. Bring them to your first year, your orientation, your first year seminar. Share, show them. You can show them the numbers, the graphs, they should, but show them the real people, the graduates of your school, of all colors, of all majors, who have done well. That, that can be very, very powerful. And show them the young ones, too. Um, what do we call that in business? Uh, Post-purchase marketing or, or preventing buyer's remorse? You know, they, they've come to your campus. Now, what can we do to give them a booster shot to say, you belong here, you've made a good choice? And let's use our alums, our transfer-ins to do that. Uh, real quick, um, let me go back here and set up the joke. <laughs> um, I think we also need to um, uh, motivate them for general education. Noel Levitt's 80s, remember, one reason why students leave, perceived irrelevance of the curriculum. I mean, why take these courses? They're not even related to my major. I still remember her name, Laura Garcia. I assume you don't know her, so I'm not violating any FERPA stuff here. 1984, new relatively new faculty member. I don't know anything about advising. Never taught of that in graduate school. And I, was, and I was working at a Catholic college where philosophy is very much part of the liberal arts, so there was a requirement. Laura Garcia was a business major, and I'm advising. Well, Laura, you got your micro and macroeconomics. Good, you got business calculus. Good, you're making great progress on your pre-major requirements, but we still need to take philosophy. And she goes, why do I have to take philosophy? I'm a business major. Again, Joe, inexperienced. Here's Joe now, just parroting. Well, it's part of your liberal arts. Uh, I don't know what the heck I was talking about. Being well-rounded like a wagon wheel. I don't know. Being, being well-rounded. And she pounded her fist. And, and I said, it's part of your liberal arts education. And she pounded her fist again on my desk. I am not liberal. I voted for Reagan last election, and so did my parents. <laughs> and it was at that point that students don't even know what liberal education is. Now, even if you don't use the word liberal education, which has the connotation you're going to make them left wing. That's, and parents think that way too. I swear I've gone to campuses, mentioned this, and a faculty member or a staff would say, I had a, fac a parent say that as well. Or even general education, it's so bland. I think we need a better term. Essential, vital, durable, transferable, flexible, agile education, cross-career flexibility. Can we sell the liberal arts better than we do? Students see them as checkoffs and just obstacles to where they want to go. It's so bad that there are now campuses, our tithing and building, College of Liberal, not in the political sense, arts. It's that, it, it, thanks for the courtesy laugh. And the other thing about liberal arts, it's not practical. Even if it makes you holistic and a better citizen and well on, it's not practical. I don't know about you. Uh, now, maybe recruiters don't get this, but um, liberal education, you look at the employability skills 21st century, it's a perfect endorsement of liberal learning in general education. Problem solving, critical thinking, even the so-called soft skills, which I'd prefer to call social intelligence and emotional intelligence, written and oral communication are what they're looking for in a technology-driven society where people have got to think on the spot. You can't train for jobs that don't exist. The case for general education is stronger than ever before. Even if you're not in the general ed program, here's another example. You have conversations with students, they complain about courses, remind them that general education is career preparation. It's not something to get out of the way before you prepare for your career. Some schools now are getting very aggressive, literature, science, and the arts, and how to apply for a job, to show that the uh, applicability or the, that's not true, another cartoon that went over like a Led Zeppelin, so don't worry about that. Um, we've got to articulate not only what liberal education means, but that it, it's, it could actually enhance their employability. Even to equip students with the language they can use when they go to an interview. I took these courses, that means nothing. What were the skills embedded in those courses that I can bring to your company or organization or your graduate school? I think all of us can play a role in articulating them. Okay. The other thing I would argue here in terms of retention in this, can we have more early experiential learning? Uh, let a, let a than, rather than waiting till junior and senior year, get some hands-on experience for them in their first or second year, hook them a bit. Uh, um, we don't want them to graduate like this. You know, my only skill is taking tests. We want to give them real-life learning employability skills, but I would argue 
let's use that early on to get them excited uh, about their college experience, not just reserve it for internships junior and senior year. Whether we front load internships, service learning, whatever we call it, uh, undergraduate research, early experiential learning, I think will help them find meaning and purpose. You have those nurses who want to be nurses. They don't even like blood. We can't wait till junior year for them to find that out. Uh, I'll have other stories, but I've got to be conscious of time. Active involvement, engagement. Thanks for listening. You, you've been very patient with me. I know I'm up here for long. This is not my usual. I'm looking forward to talking with you rather than talking at you. Um, active involvement, that's an old Aston term. Ku calls it engagement. This is sort of the centerpiece uh, of, of the whole thing. I mean, uh, many schools that I go, they want me to talk about engagement, but I don't like to jump there. I would argue the things that we've talked about, why did I front load those three? I see them as prerequisites for engagement. Students will become engaged if they know we care that, that they're engaged, right? They'll become engaged if they think they can do it at self-efficacy. They'll become engaged if they see the point or the meaning of doing it. So I would argue the three principles we talked about are really almost precursors to engagement. We have to do that first. Then engagement is more likely to follow. Rather than, that's why I didn't put that as number one. Um, but it's certainly the hip term now. It used to be a premarital commitment. Now I can't get it out of my head that it's just it's a learning principle and a retention principle. What do we do to promote engagement? Well, faculty, as you know, engaging pedagogy is the big thing. We're killing, the lecture is killing us. PowerPoint is killing us. Um, we need an alternative to lecture. Um, John Dewey put it this way. So again, timeless. Why is it, in spite of the fact that teaching by pouring in and learning by passive absorption are universally condemned, that they are still so entrenched in practice? That's 1916, uh, timeless, uh, this notion of just talking at people for extended periods of time, which unfortunately I'm doing to you now, is not a, a good thing. Now, it, as faculty, here's our thing, and you run into this too. Came up with one of the questions for Sandy. Uh, fact, we're very covetous of time. We're very content-driven and time-sensitive. We got lots of material to cover, Short period of time, we don't have time for this student-centered stuff and small group and, and all that kind of thing. So, oh, we have no time in the curriculum for a first-year seminar. We got too much other stuff to cover in our, in our disciplines. Um, I, I like this. I don't, these are not cartoons. I would prefer to call these as content-relevant, emotional, visual, educational aids that I'm showing you now. Um, Here's a guy very much wrapped up in the lecture. I sense that a hand is raised, yet I cannot turn around because he's got to get through that math stuff. Um, that's the classic. Now, I'm not picking on the mathematicians. We could have put historian up there who's trying to cover 3,000 years of history or anatomy and physiology where they got 13 glands and 84 bones to cover in the body, and uh, there's no room for uh, time to. We need to slow down. You've heard of pair, share, and pause. The research on lecture processing is maybe eight to 10 minutes, and then it starts to fade. Even among highly motivated medical students and graduate students, much of that research from England and Scotland, interesting. I know I, I'm gonna get back on track time-wise. Where in America, we were always focused on the teacher, what the great teacher is doing, the great lecturer. In England and Scotland, it was taboo to put the camera on the teacher. So they put the camera on the students. They studied what the students were doing when the professors were lecturing. So much of our research about how students' note-taking starts to decline after about 10 minutes, that we have to, I'm not saying the death of lecture, faculty. We need to share, knowledgeable people sharing their knowledge is still important, but just not for extended periods of time. Punctuate it every 10 minutes. I do a short minute paper, which I'll talk about, a short pair share. But in England, Scotland, that's where the research came from, because they were seeing attention drift even among highly motivated medical students and graduate students. Now, I'm not picking just on faculty. Uh, student affairs folks, you know, we can do this too. I see orientation programs, it was just a bunch of talking heads. It's information overload. One community college called it one long commercial, their, their orientation program. Um, Pascarell and Terenzini, I'm sorry I keep plugging the Italians, they just happened to end in a vowel. Um, they found the most important thing in orientation is social integration and timely information. Give them what they need to know now. Ideally, have an extended orientation course, like a time release capsule that gives them the other stuff they need as they go through the term. The most important thing, 
personal validation and social integration, uh, goals of orientation. So we have to watch that too. Even in first year seminars, I see some of them, it's a bunch of guest speakers, one after the other after the other. It's talking heads as well. Uh, engagement, you knew this already, but it applies both to pedagogy and to out of class um, uh, behavior as well. I always liked the, I got in the habit toward the end of my career of using, uh, pausing three times. At the beginning of class, you've heard of, if you not activate what students are, think they know about something before you start talking about it. So if you're talking about stress, when I say stress, what comes to your mind? Or when I talk about motivation or whatever the, so get, activate what they already know. Then you start talking about it, then punctuate, break it up. After 10 minutes, have them do something else. So there's a beginning, a middle, and then wrap it up at the end. Some kind of uh, minute paper at the end that kind of consolidates. So it's almost like warm up, break up, wrap it up, or pump. Activate, punctuate, consolidate. Let's look at our programs as a three-part sequence to take advantage of what we know about attention span and engagement. We can engage them at those three critical junctures, at the beginning, in the, in the middle, and at the end. Um, reflection, how are we on time? Oh boy, I'm coming to the end, I promise, guys. Uh, how are we, I, I should be done by, nine, by 9.45? Yes, I've got it, I, I, I should do it. Uh, but I want to leave more time for questions. Uh, reflection. Now, I guess you could call reflection a form of engagement. I'm finding it's different. Do you find some students, they really can get into a buzz group or discussion group, but they're not really, well, let me do Dewey. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on our experiences. So engagement is one thing, but they have to reflect on what they're engaged about. Have you heard that joke? Somebody's got five years of experience. Not really. They've had one year experience five consecutive years in a row. They've never reflected on what they did in the first year and grew from it. Um, you know the, the expression, practice makes perfect. But if you don't reflect on your practice, practice just makes permanent whatever you were doing first if you keep doing it over and over again. So reflection really matters. That gets students to back off. On, I'm going to do a couple little brain things here because Sandy did. So I'm so competitive. I got to do my brain things as well. Um, remember the thinker? Um, this would be reflection. You know when students have those, when we have those lateral eye movements, you kind of go up in the corner. That's a kind of a different state than when you're engaged in a discussion and you're actively engaged. This is a different mental state. And if you look at the brain, um, you see that kind of worm-like structure in the middle there called the hippocampus. You've heard the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory or working memory and long-term memory. What engagement will do, I'm trying to keep you engaged right now. Now, later we, we may reflect. I'm trying to hold your attention. Attention will get you into your working memory. But whether you retain what I'm talking about requires reflection. Looking back, thinking about what we talked about, the, moving it up from short-term memory to long-term memory. Two different mental processes, and they involve different... You heard of EEG, the brainwave pattern? When students are engaged, they produce beta waves which are low frequency, I think high amplitude waves. You've heard of alpha waves like meditators do and people are mindful. That's more typical of reflection. So even if, and wouldn't it be great if we had portable EEGs we could put on our students to see if they really were paying attention or thinking deep. Those little yarmulkes that they put on their head and we could, uh, never mind. But we really do need reflection in addition to um, um, e engagement. Uh, Students take what you know and then move it up to long-term memory, connect it to what they already know. You've heard of that learning is not a transmission of knowledge from the teacher to the student, but a transformation of knowledge by the student into what the student, connecting it to what the students. Oh, the idea of knowledge is constructed. You build knowledge by having students reflect and connect on what you're teaching them to what they already know. Now, how do we do that? Um, I, I, what I should be doing now is stopping and giving you time to think about what I've been saying all along. Again, our obsession with coverage. We need just a, a pregnant pause. It could just be a minute. I'll show you the minute paper in a second. The art of a good question, I've learned this. Uh, the right question at the right time with the right prompt, we could do it anywhere on campus. You've heard of the one minute paper started by a physics professor at Berkeley. It's always good with faculty. Go to the hard science that's at the top of the pecking order from a prestigious university. Now at least there we got engagement. Um, he did it at the end of class to check if students were following what he was, was saying. 
You might have heard it. What was the muddiest point today? What resonates with you? They did it anonymously. I've adopted the minute tape paper for a variety of things, for advising sessions, class sessions, where they sign it. It's a great way to take attendance, by the way, without having to call roll, because they do a one-minute paper. And I like the idea of prompts. And I can send you this, too. Uh, I have this all laid out. Um, intentional, you know, you've learned about Bloom's taxonomy or higher order thinking skills. We can manipulate questions depending on what your program is or what you're teaching them. The short pause at the end to get them to think, good way to take attendance, get feedback, get them to connect. It could be a simple question um, about what did you take away from this, this program or this service or advising session? What do you know now that you didn't know before, if anything? Have your attitudes changed in any way? Do you, you think your behavior, heard of the ABCs of assessment, will your behavior change in any way as a result of this program or interaction? Or what do you know now that you didn't know before? C, cognitive. Simple questions to get them to think. And writing matters as someone who's not an English professor. Writing and thinking are inextricably interrelated. Writing slows down the thinking process, makes it more deliberate. Help me with the pronunciation. He said, Nobel Prize winner, Holocaust, Survival, El Eli Wiesel or Wiesel? Wiesel? Wiesel, yes. Um, I like the way uh, he says it. I write to understand as much as to be understood. I write to understand what I'm learning as much as to convey a message to somebody else. So I think that can be done anywhere on campus, after an advising session, Anywhere, short one-minute paper. And ideally, if I was good at this, I didn't get used technology. If I had all this loaded on a learning management system, do you see the data we could mine from uh, qualitative data if we could collect all those one-minute paper responses? I go back to what Sandy was saying yesterday. Open-ended questions sometimes give you some really rich data that four surveys can't. And this is just in time. They've just experienced that session. I wish we could from an assessment standpoint, amalgamate these kind of uh, reaction papers and reflection papers in a way. We've got software for that now, qualitative software, do word cloud analysis. Uh, um, just a thought. Coming to the end. Oh, boy, I should be at the end. These are last two are very short. Social integration, that's a Tinto thing. That's the Tinto quote. I won't read it to you. He's so popular. I've heard his name at least 12 times here. Makes me proud to be an Italian. Uh, but it's social integration so critical for retention. And again, is that new? Well, Tinto's model is dominant, but you remember Maslow's need hierarchy. It's really a replication of that, too. Once students feel they belong and are safe, then they're going to self-actualize. So we have, again, replication across time. How do we do this? A couple of quick points. As a faculty member, I was on that retention committee that I was voluntold to be on. I was amazed when I reviewed the research, as important as my class was and how much prep time I put in, those interactions with students outside of class, so important, first faculty and staff and other professionals on campus. Um, how can we promote that? Uh, I would argue we might even have assignments where students meet with faculty uh, interviews. Uh, promote those connections outside of class. Certainly connections with peers matter here, affinity groups, Learning communities matter, um, and uh, having students, giving them the option of, of developing their own um, clubs and organizations. And you know, again, this is another example. Is this is retention or is this learning? You heard of constructed knowledge, but then have you heard of socially constructed knowledge? Why do we have common reading programs? If I read independent of Shelley, and then we come together, we build on each other's knowledge. So this social integration, this idea of connecting peers with peers, it's not just good for retention. It's good for deep learning and higher order thinking. When students bounce ideas off peers who see things differently, that is one of the deepest ways. You're familiar with Stephen Brookfield and his work on critical thinking, a big advocate of peers working with peers. So we can kill two birds with one stone here. The extent that we integrate socially, we promote retention, deep learning, and higher level thinking. I know you're not going to believe this. Next, but give it a chance. You know how in psychology we have rats run mazes independently? Now, they're pretty good at that. Some rats are more gifted than others. This study, they allowed the rats to collaborate and construct knowledge prior to... Now, don't, again, please don't laugh. This is serious stuff. And um, they were allowed to do that. 
and the result of superior critical think problem solving solution, uh, constructed knowledge, building on each other, interdependent roles like a good team. Now you're laughing, couldn't be possible. But note well, these were gifted Italian rats of my ethnicity. <laughs> They were raised by Joe Cusi with multiple degrees, some academic, some psychedelic, uh, but they had a great role model. And all this took place in the, in, the, in the learning capital of the world, Queens, New York, near LaGuardia Airport. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry to be silly. I thought you maybe needed a, a joke at this point of the, uh, this pain I'm inflicting on you. Uh, one other element that was mentioned yesterday, the importance of family, as you know that. Uh, Noel Levitz made that. You don't retain the student, you retain the family. And I think that argument is even stronger today with first generation students. They could help us, as, or as you know, they could sabotage our efforts as well. Why aren't you home supporting the family? Uh, you think you're better than us. Uh, we need to bring family in here, whether it's orientation, family weekend, um, hotlines, newsletter. Um, family are part of that social integration network. Um, lastly, and I'm sorry I went a little longer than uh, I intended, self-awareness. Um, we talk about reflecting on what you're learning, but now this is reflecting on yourself. This is introspection, I guess I would call this. Um, you remember, and this is one of the hallmarks. You've heard of metacognition. Students or successful learners know a lot about themselves. I'm quoting Claire Weinstein at University of Texas, Austin. Um, but it's also classic liberal arts stuff. This is another case of what's good for retention, and is this is liberal learning, and this is the platonic, I think it's Plato or Socrates, they're always hanging out together, I forget which is which, but the idea of know thyself is a, a cardinal goal of general education, and certainly self-knowledge is what we do a lot in first year experience and academic advising. Um, I would harken back again, this is the first step in any major career choice, right? Don't students have to know themselves before they know their path? I'm, I'm very excited about guided pathways, but it's the guided part that I'm worried about. I know we got the pathways. They can see the, the path to the watering hole, but I, I, want, I want to have some guidance on helping them choose the right path. Getting on the fast track is fine, but I want them to be on the right track, because if they fall off that, then, then they have to backtrack. I'm getting overdone with these tracks, and that slows down their time to graduation. But this idea of self-awareness as in terms of learning about their talents, their needs, their values, their passions and interests, and how that can contribute to their careers. So, then I think it's, was it um, Shakespeare, know thyself and help me here, I need help from the audience, to thine own self be true. I think it's in a play of, of Shakespeare. Know who you are and then pursue a path that aligns with who you are. Uh, you know, students will not persist if they don't sense a goal have no sense of direction. I would argue that in our academic, we talk about academic support for first year students. The academic support should not only be for learning skills, how to take notes, I think they need support for academic direction. That's all part of the academic, choosing a major and seeing the connection between majors and career. If they choose a path that they're passionate about, they're more likely to persist to complete that path and complete the degree, which is true for all students. But for first generation low income students, completing their path, that's their ticket to a better st economic prosperity or even economic stability and a better quality of life. I'm sorry I went over, I, I, I got too emotional again. Thank you for your attention. Do we have any time at all to talk? I guess not, do we? <laughs> no, thank you.